no introduction, but I've been tasked with the job, so I'll try as hard as I can. I want to thank Michael and Sharon Cronenberg for sponsoring this morning's lecture and breakfast, and his sponsor in the memory of Mr. Lou Herman, and Father Arya Yatov Eliezer and Avtali Lashalom, and Mrs. Sarah Ferrum, Sarif Kibas from Mordechai Lashalom, Lou Herman's website is today, and Sarah Ferrum's website is coming up this week. It's tonight. Tonight. And the Nisham Shabbat and Aliyah. The, um, the topic today is certainly timely. And uh, I'm reminded of the advice that's often given by therapists to those who are suffering from anxiety, which is to try to remember a time where you went through a similar situation and you came through it. And uh, as a people, we've been through a lot of similar situations over the centuries and the millennia. And oftentimes when I am uh, faced with uh, anxiety over the state of our current world, it's Rabbi Wine who's in my head. It's Rabbi Wine who's taught me, and I think all of us here in this room, and I would dare say much of the Jewish world, that we have a long storied history that uh, we've seen this before. And that uh, everyone who's here this morning is testament to the fact that we've made it through. And it's times like that where I realize how much Rabbi Wine's perspective has influenced and shaped my perspective on the world and the way that we view things. Certainly here in our shul, our entire nature is made up by the seeds which Rabbi Wine planted. He's gone on to educate all of Judaism to recognize where we come from so we can know where we're going to. And it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Lorena Verabeno. Uh, I have a uh, response to Rabbi Godly. Uh, there's a great uh, Jewish anecdote about the uh, Hasid. Uh, who wanted to have a son, who wanted to have a male heir. So he went to the Rebbe and he said, uh, give me a, uh, a school, or give me a magical potion that will guarantee that my wife will give birth to a boy. So the Rebbe said to him, listen, go out and buy a chicken. And uh, take the comb off of the face of the chicken and grind it into a powder and uh, have a sheikh and shech the chicken and then you mix the powder with water and I'm giving you a parchment with a blessing on it and you put it, you mix it all together and your wife will wear it for nine months. And the Rebbe told him to do it, he went and he did it and uh, as you can imagine he had a girl. <laughs> so he came back to the rabbit. So the rabbit said, uh, what color chicken did you get? <laughs> so he said, I got a brown chicken. He said, oh, hey, that's the wrong chicken. You got to get a white chicken. So he got a white chicken. He went through the whole thing again. Nine months later, he comes back to the rabbit. She had a girl. The rabbit says to him, who was the sheikh? <laughs> So he said, the sheikh was kind. He said, hey, hey, that's the wrong sheikh. You got to get gross, should be the sheikh. So he goes and gets a white chicken, and he uh, gets gross as the sheikh, and then she has a girl. He comes back to the rabbit once more. 
And the Rebbe says, who'd you buy the chicken from? He said, I bought it from Levi. He said, no, that's the wrong guy. You should have bought it from him. You should have bought it from Cohen. So now he goes out, he goes through the whole thing again, and another girl. He comes back to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe says to him, Oy vey, you went to the wrong Rebbe. <laughs> so, this uh, shul is privileged to have the right Rebbe. You yeah, have Rabbi Gottlieb as your Marta Asra, you really have a treasure and a gem. And you should appreciate that. And uh, we should all hear good news one from another in all facets of our existence. Uh, as was mentioned, today's uh, words here are Lili Nishmas and Mr. Lou Herman, and Elezer Yaka Chover, Elezer Yaakov, and Mrs. Uh, Sarah Thurn, Max Thurns. Uh, mother, Allah, I show them, so I rivka. And the Shomas should have an aliyah, and we should treasure their memories and be strengthened by it. Uh, Charles Dickens, in his famous Tale of Two Cities, began uh, with uh, the uh, immortal sentence that it was the best of all times and the worst of all times. And we could say that about our time as well, in many respects. But it certainly is a time of great change, when uh, the things that we thought were, uh, so to speak, set in stone, uh, no longer are uh, so certain. And uh, the multitude of problems that surround us uh, if we view them constantly and in concert, so then they are frightening. So I'd like to divide uh, this immortal lecture into uh, two uh, different uh, facets. One is general, uh, uh, the non-Jewish world as well, and one is uh, the Jewish world uh, which is also undergoing a tremendous change. The general world is a very dangerous one, simply because of the fact that the technology of killing people is so advanced uh, that it has no limits. And it is so available uh, that uh, you don't need a license uh, to uh, build a bomb or to build a rocket, uh, anybody can do it. And when we're talking about a world of billions of people, so there always are a few people who are on the fringe. And those people who are on the fringe are ones that we should definitely be afraid of. Um, the uh, man that's running North Korea is an enormous danger to the world. He's, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I think he's mentally unhinged. Uh, but he has nuclear weapons. And he has rockets. And he has ICBMs. And no one knows what uh, ticks him off. And that's a fearsome thing. And uh, my generation experienced already what someone who was pathologically unstable could do to the world. Eighty million people were killed in the first world, in the second world war, one way or another, between Stalin and Hitler. So that's a very dangerous thing in the world. And we have an uncertain uh, president of the United States that we don't know exactly where he wants to go and how he wants to get there. So if you, uh, and if you read the newspapers, which is something that I studiously uh, attempt to avoid, I mean, if you want to ruin your day, just, uh, you know. <laughs> so, uh, 
where, where are we going? What, what's going to be with us? And then, uh, to compound the problem, is the fact that uh, Western civilization has gone through a sea change in terms of values. Uh, I, uh, I once was a student in the American public school system in Chicago. So, uh, in elementary school, second grade, uh, there was a boy's entrance and a girl's entrance in public school. And uh, the entire value system that existed in American society uh, 60, 70 years ago is no longer here. Not only no longer here, it's been turned on its head. Things that were once acceptable that today are politically incorrect and things that once were considered immoral today are at the top of the list. Because I will tell us that a great uh, Tana had a near-death experience. And in the near-death experience, he visited heaven. And then when he recovered, so his colleagues asked him, what did you see in heaven? Tell us what it looks like there. So he said, Olam Hofu Kreisi. I saw the world is upside down. El Yomi Lamata, Tachtoni Lamala, people here who are considered to be on top, there they sit on the bottom. And people here who don't have much respect, there they sit at the top of the table. Olam Hof, world that is completely opposite. And the rabbi answered him, Lo, no, you made a mistake. You saw the world for the first time correctly. You saw it clearly. Because the world here is confused. It's not clear. And in thrashing about, all sorts of difficulties are created. It will take a long time to sort out. Jewish people, Chazal especially, in the time of the Second Temple and in the period immediately destruction after the destruction of the Second Temple, lived in the time of Roman culture, which basically was Greek culture. Greek culture was homosexuality, uh, was sexual depravity, was violence, was a world of slavery, now, it had many glorious aspects to it as well. It was art and the theater and architecture and music and drama. It was democracy, which is a Greek word. But in that world of values, uh, Chazal, uh, the rabbis, uh, shut the door. And therefore, they said the famous statement, Chochmo Bagoyim Tani. If somebody comes and tells you that the world has Chochmo, Chochmo is wisdom, knowledge, technology, there's a Sorbonne, there's an Oxford, there's a Harvard, Tani, Galita, that's true. Torah Bagoyim Al Tani. But if you think that that's the key to a moral state, if you think that's the key to a peaceful, serene life existence, if you think that that is a mission statement, I'll tell you, don't believe that. That is not true. The statistics show that over a third of all of the commandants of the Nazi death camps were either PhDs or MDs. There are people with chachma. But people with chachma can easily become murderers. Because there's no Torah, there's no moral inhibition. And the entire structure of Western society today uh, 
has been to remove any moral inhibitions. And my uh, good friend, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky, So he uh, was a psychiatrist in Pittsburgh for many decades. He, he was famous for his work on addiction. And because of his work on addiction, he had a lot to do with the Catholic Church. Because uh, alcoholism and other problems that uh, permeates the church. And uh, he said uh, that the, uh, the Cardinal told him that you're the only psychiatrist in Pittsburgh that we can send a priest for counseling because anyone else that we'll send him to will immediately say, well, your first problem is religion. So in a world where that's the first problem, so it's very hard. It's hard to raise children, it's hard to have an educational system. It's hard to be part of society. So Chazan were faced pretty much with what we are faced with. Are we part of society? A society that to a great extent stands against every value and principle that we hold dear. and that imposes its will upon us. Or do we just close the door and everybody move to New Square? Which is also not immune from the problems. Chazal somehow navigated it. The Gemara says it's a very interesting Gemara, and I've always thought of it, why we never followed it. The Gemara says, Ram Gamliel of Yavne, the second Ram Gamliel, had a thousand Talmudim, the Gemara says. He had a thousand students, 500 of whom he taught only Greek culture, and 500 of whom he taught only Torah. And I always wondered, what in the world is the Gemara talking about? If he told me that he had a thousand students and he taught them all Torah and their Eretz, or he taught them exclusively Torah, then uh, uh, that's a program that I understand. But I don't understand a program that half the student body is studying only secular studies and half the, uh, the student body is studying only Torah. I once heard from a great man that uh, he thought that Rabbi Gamliel realized that, that he needed both. But he also realized that it's very hard to have both in one person, in one section of a society alone. And therefore he chose that method, and he felt that if he had the 500 that were studying Chochmah Sivonis, Greek culture, but he had them in the confines of his base medrash, in the confines of his influence, that somehow it would work out. If we look over Jewish history, uh, there's been a constant struggle on this issue uh, from the time of Ram Gamliel till our time. There has never been any unanimity regarding the study of philosophy, secular studies, etc., etc. Jewish people have never agreed so some are going one way, some are going another way. And uh, that struggle continues until today. You raise children, grandchildren in today's world, what do you tell them? 
what's necessary for them. So we've had uh, inverse ideas. There are children that from the time of uh, that they are very young, they're inculcated with the idea that they're going to uh, spend the rest of their life somehow studying Torah and being supported by the Jewish community. And then there are those who are inculcated from their first, earliest years that they're going to go to Harvard and win a Nobel Prize in physics. I would imagine it depends who the child is. But the truth of the matter is that the Jewish people have never decided how to raise their children. And have never decided exclusively which way we are going to go. And a lot of it, therefore, depends on the outside world. What kind of outside world is it? So there was a time, as I mentioned, when if you went to the American public school system, you got a lot of positive religious values. I mean, I had, uh, when I went to public school till seventh grade, I had all Irish spinster school teachers who, uh, you know, who uh, didn't mind wrapping you a lost the knuckles, and they taught you how to read and write, and taught you not to lie, and taught you uh, all sorts of wonderful things. that were in line with being Jewish. The only thing that wasn't in line with it were Christmas carols. I have my famous Rabbi Tversky story that he was uh, in a car. I was in the car with him and there were uh, uh, two great Russian yeshiva in the car with us. And Tversky always likes to stir the drink uh, said to me, he said, Beryl, uh, you and I, we had a great education when we went to public school. So I told him, yes, she, I went to, but we went to public school. So one of the Russian Shiva turns around and he says, uh, you can make a guy in the public school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first he looks at him uh, scans, but he said, if you said he went, you went. The other one was the last man in the world that you would suspect of such a heresy said, uh, I, I also went to public school. Of course, he said, I don't believe you. He said, I'm telling you, I went to public school. So Tversky says, prove it. Sing Silent Night. <laughs> <laughs> Which all of us can. <laughs> but public school was... Uh, value-wise, was in order with us. It was based on uh, the Ten Commandments. It resonated, uh, which is not true today at all. Uh, and the, uh, so the problem today is a great problem. And uh, all of the Jewish educational institutions in the Orthodox world certainly are wrestling with the problem whether they say they are or not. And since uh, the Lord made us different people, there's no one size fits all. Uh, so uh, it takes a great deal of uh, I don't know if even tolerance is a word, but it, it takes a very broad view to be able to deal with the Jewish world today and with the Jewish children today. That is a very, very crucial issue in my uh, estimation. And I don't think it's easily solved, and I don't think it's rapidly solved, but it is undergoing changes. That brings me to speak a little about uh, the state of Israel and the Jewish society in Israel. The great uh, joker in the deck, the thing that we have nothing to compare it with, why you cannot learn, so to speak, exactly from past Jewish history to present Jewish problems, 
is the existence of the state of Israel. Chazal uh, and the Posek of Peshuv Hashem at Shiva Tzion Hoyinu Kecholmin We are but dreamers. So Chazal say, what does it mean but dreamers? So there are different types of dreams. There are dreams that are pleasant. Uh, there are dreams that are not so pleasant. There are dreams that we get up in the morning and we remember the dream. In most dreams, we get up in the morning and we don't realize what we dream. That's the state of Israel. It's a dream. A bunch of tailors and shoemakers came and made a state. After 2,000 years of exile, not only made a state, uh, they uh, were able to absorb millions of Jews from different cultures all over the world and make it work. It's the miracle of the ages. Chazal say, Kosher Yom Shal Kibbutz Goliaths. We had a Jew from Afghanistan, and a Jew from Russia, and a Jew from New York, and a Jew from France, and they're all fighting for the same parking space. Both figuratively and literally. And it's had such an effect on the Jewish world. And the Jewish community in America could not be what it is if it were not for the fact that the state of Israel existed. And uh, it's a work in progress. Changes. The state of Israel was originally founded as a socialist secular state. Uh, to a certain extent as an anti-religious state. The uh, founders of the state so hated the exile and the exile mentality of the Jews that they were willing to throw out the baby with the bathwater. But it didn't turn out to be that kind of a state. Turned out to be a very traditional place, a very Jewish place. Uh, I would hazard to say that uh, most of American Jewry was unaware that the 15th of Shvat passed upon us. And Israel's a big deal. Everything's a big deal. I mean, the whole calendar, the whole rhythm of life is the values of the Jewish people. And I'm telling that observance is a, uh, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum. And the Jewish state uh, represents something. Now, the uh, Jewish state itself finds itself in a conundrum because it declares itself to be a democratic Jewish state. Now, many times those two words of description contradict each other. You want to be completely democratic, you're not going to be very Jewish. You want to be very Jewish, you're not going to be democratic. And that's the fault line that exists in the country. That's the Teutonic plagues that, uh, pl uh, plates that rub against each other. That's the Supreme Court, that's the Knesset, that's the politics. <coughs> because we're still trying to find our way. And it'll be a long time in coming again because it took us a long time to get into this mess. You know, it takes uh, 40 miles to turn around an aircraft carrier. So it takes the time to turn around the uh, a country and a set of values and <coughs> people. But the fact that the state exists, and the fact that it has power, I mean, it's almost a lack.